Hi, so in section 2.6, we're going to be looking at limits at infinity. So we're going to be looking at two separate things. Uh, one is going to be horizontal asymptotes, and the other one's going to be vertical asymptotes. We're going to start with horizontal asymptotes. So what horizontal asymptotes tell us is a function's behavior in the long run. So what that means is that a function f of x was going to have a horizontal asymptote at y equals l if, as x gets infinitely bigger, our function goes to L. This is also true if you're looking at X going to negative infinity. So let's look at some examples. So the first one, we have this function that has one horizontal asymptote. So as we look at the limit of this function, we're going to be looking at two different limits. First, we're going to be looking as X gets infinitely bigger in the positive direction. So this would be the limit as x approaches positive infinity of our function. Now, as x approaches positive infinity, here's the thing, is that we notice that our y value looks like it's getting closer to a certain value. So, as our x's get bigger, what we notice is that our y's, or our limit, looks like it's approaching 2. Now, in the same vein, if we look at x getting infinitely smaller, that means negative, right? What we see is that as our x values get infinitely smaller, our y values also look like they're approaching 2. Now what that's going to look like on the graph is that as our x values get bigger, it looks like our graph is going to lazily get closer to this y equals line. Okay, now let's look at an example that has two horizontal asymptotes. So again, if we plug in values of x that get bigger and bigger and bigger, so closer to positive infinity, right here, what we see is that our y value is going to get closer and closer to 1.5697, etc., etc., that's actually going to be positive pi over 2. Okay, So what we see here is positive pi over 2 is that as our x value gets bigger and bigger and bigger, so as our x value goes to infinity, our graph is going to get closer and closer and closer to that pi over 2 mark. Something similar is going to happen as x gets increasingly larger in the negative direction, our y value is going to get closer to that negative 1.569, etc. What that is actually getting closer to is it's getting closer to negative pi over 2. Okay, so negative pi over 2 is what our function is going to get closer to as our x value gets closer to negative infinity. So it's what's happening to our functions in the long term. If we keep plugging x values in and they keep getting either really big positively or really big negatively, does it look like our y value is going to be approaching some number? Now some functions aren't going to have any horizontal asymptotes. Okay, so for example, if we have the graph 3x plus 2, that's just a linear equation, that's just a straight line. And what you'll notice is as our x values get big, Okay, so do our y values. They also get big. Okay, so what we would say here is we would say that the limit as x approaches infinity of our function, we'll call this f of x, or it's called h of x here, I'll keep it h of x, would be infinity. That means that there's no horizontal asymptote. Similarly, down here, if we plug in more negative values, we're going to get more negative values. It doesn't matter if it's reaching negative or positive values or either way. We still don't have it reaching a specific numerical value. So it still doesn't have a horizontal asymptote. Can you guys think of another graph that maybe would have some weird behavior that wouldn't have a horizontal asymptote? Here's one. If we draw sine, sine is going to bounce up and down between 1 and negative 1 forever. 
So here's the issue with that is because it's bouncing up and down forever, it has no finite number that it's approaching. So we would say the limit as x approaches infinity of sine of x would not exist. So it would also not have a horizontal asymptote. All right. <clears throat> Now, we can probably identify a horizontal asymptote if we look at a graph or if we look at a number table, but how do we do this algebraically? Where well, here's the deal, is that as long as r is greater than zero, if you're taking the limit as x approaches infinity of one over x to the r, that's going to equal zero. The reason that's true is because if you raise any x value to a positive number, as that x value gets bigger, the denominator is going to get super, 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 super big. And 1 divided by a super, super big number is actually a very small number close to 0. So we're going to use this to evaluate the following limits. So let's say that we want to evaluate the limit as x goes to infinity of 10x squared plus x minus 1 divided by 5x squared minus 3x plus 7. Here's how we're going to do this. We are going to pick on the highest power of x and we're going to multiply this whole thing by 1 over x squared divided by 1 over x squared. Remember, I can do that because that's just a fancy looking 1, okay? So essentially what I'm going to be doing is dividing every single um, term by x squared. So what this becomes is this becomes the limit as x approaches infinity of, so 10x squared divided by x squared is just going to give us 10, plus x divided by x squared will give us 1 over x, minus 1 divided by x squared will give us 1 over x squared, 5x squared divided by x squared will give us 5, minus 3 divided by x, plus 7 divided by x squared. Now remember, <clears throat> we're just dividing every term by x squared. Now here is the really cool thing. This term, this term, this term, and this term are all some sort of constant divided by x to some positive power. Now here's the neat thing. From a previous section, we said that we could take the limit <coughs> of functions being added, subtracted, multiplied, and divided. Okay? So this is kind of like taking the limit of each part. So the limit of this piece is going to go to 0. That will also go to 0, this will go to 0, and this will go to 0. So since each of those pieces are going to go to 0, this is going to be 10 plus 0 minus 0 divided by 5 minus 0 plus 0. So what that means is that as x goes to infinity, each of these little pieces are going to become nothing, right? They're going to get really close to 0. So we're going to end up with 10 divided by 5, which is going to give us 2. Another way to think of this, if you want to think of it like in a philosophical way, is that as x gets really, really big towards infinity, right, these x squareds are going to dominate this function so much that the x and the 1 and the 3x and the 7 are going to be kind of null, right? They're not going to really matter. So what's going to really dominate this function is going to be the 10x squared and the 5x squared on the bottom. Now the ratio of 10 times infinity squared divided by 5 times infinity squared is going to give you a ratio of 2. All right, let's use the same idea and let's evaluate this limit as x approaches infinity of 9x plus 1 divided by 3x squared plus 2. Again, what we're going to do here is we're going to pick on the largest power and divide everything by that. So the largest power here is x squared. So we're going to multiply it by 1 over x squared, divided by 1 over x squared. That's going to give us the limit as x approaches infinity of, so 9x divided by x squared will give us 9 over x plus 1 over x squared divided by 3 plus 2 over x squared. Remember, we're just dividing everything by an x squared. Now we're going to do the same thing, so we're going to look at each piece. So as x gets really, really, really big, 9 divided by a really, really, really big number is going to be getting really close to 0. 1 divided by a really, really big number squared is also going to go to 0. 
and this will also go to zero. That three remains untouched, and here's the reason why, is because there's no x attached to it. So what's the limit of three? Well, it's just three. So we're gonna end up with zero plus zero divided by three plus zero, which is gonna give us three out of zero. Now here's the thing, don't forget, we're not allowed to divide by zero on the denominator, but zero divided by three, how much do you have if you have zero of three things? You have zero. So that would be our answer. All right, now before we get to the next example, <clears throat> uh, we have to make a couple quick notes, and this is just review. So if you take the square root of x squared, it's only going to equal x if x was a positive number to begin with. Okay? So for example, if I take, let's say, 3, and I plug 3 in and I square it, Okay, that's going to give me 9, and then the square root of 9 is going to give me 3 back. Now the issue is that if x was a negative number, well then these sides are only going to be equal if I throw a negative in front of the x. So, for example, if I have negative 3 squared, that's going to give me a positive 9, and then the square root of 9 is going to give me positive 3. So to get both sides to match up, I have to have negative, negative 3 on the right-hand side. The reason this is is because the square root function only returns positive numbers. So for both sides to be equal, we have to manipulate the negative signs. The other thing is that you can only combine the insides, so we're on ii now, we can only combine the insides of square roots um, if both pieces are being squared. Okay? So what I mean by that is that if you have x times the square root of x, for example, well, before you can combine those, you have to rewrite this one here. So let's rewrite that as the square root of x squared times that square root x. Okay, and what we get is that that is the same thing as the square root of x cubed. All right, now, Let's say for the, ne the next example, we want to evaluate the limit of the square root of 4x squared plus 9 divided by 4x minus 1. So we're going to do the same thing we did last time. We're going to kind of pick on the highest, um, the highest power of x that we see, which in the top would be x squared. But remember, we're taking the square root of the whole thing, so it would just be x. And on the bottom, it would also be x. So we're going to multiply this by a fancy 1. We're going to multiply this by the square root of 1 over, whoops, x squared divided by 1 over x. Now, by the properties I just uh, told you guys above, these top and bottom pieces are the same. So what that's going to end up giving us is that's going to end up giving us the limit as x approaches infinity of the square root of 4x squared divided by x squared. Remember, we can factor that 1 over x squared through because it's also underneath the square root, plus 9 over x squared divided by 4x over x minus 1 over x. Now, here's the neat part. These x squareds are going to cancel out. <clears throat> this piece is going to go to zero as x gets bigger, as will this piece, and these x's will cancel out. So what we are going to be left with is the limit as x approaches infinity of the square root of 4 divided by 4, which is going to give us 2 over 4, which will give us 1 half. Awesome. And the reason we were able to do that is because x was going to positive infinity. Now for the next one, we want to evaluate the limit as x goes to negative infinity. So if we do the square root of x squared, that's only going to be true if we have that negative in front. So what we are going to do is we are going to multiply this by, again, 1 over x squared, but remember, we have to throw that negative out in front 
divide it by 1 over x. So this is going to give us the limit as x approaches, remember, negative infinity. And now we're going to have negative square root of 4 plus 9 over x squared divided by 4 minus 1 over x. Again, this piece is going to go to 0. This piece will go to 0. So what we're going to be left with is negative square root 4 over 4, which is going to give us negative 1 half. Okay, let's go ahead and go to Desmos and just graphically check our work and see if it's right. Let's see if it makes sense to us. All right, so we're going to go ahead and let f of x equal the square root of 4x a second plus 9 divided by 4x minus 1. Okay, so if I look at this guy, it does look like as my x gets larger in the positive direction, it looks like my y values are approaching positive 1 half. So if you look at the y values, it looks like they're approaching positive 1 half. Now if I look at x as x gets closer to negative infinity, it looks like it is approaching negative 1 half. Do you see how at negative 18.17 for my x value, my y value is negative 0.495? Yeah, so we did a great job. So something just to keep in mind is if you're dealing with square roots, okay? So when I say square roots, I mean square roots, fourth roots, sixth roots, so even roots. Those can only return positive numbers. So if you're looking at the negative infinity, you have to balance that by putting that negative out in front. All right, so a quick rule of thumb if you ever want to check your work is if you're taking the limit of a polynomial P and a polynomial Q, Okay, and you have P and Q like this, so they're dividing by each other. That limit's going to equal zero if the degree of P is less than the degree of Q. So if the degree of the top polynomial is less than the degree of the bottom polynomial, it's going to equal zero. Okay, the limit as X goes to infinity is going to equal infinity if the degree of P is greater than the degree of Q. So an example of this first one would be if you had, for example, 4x squared plus 1 divided by 8x cubed minus 7x squared. So since the degree on the top is 2 and the degree on the bottom is 3, that means the degree of Q is bigger than the degree of P. So the degree on the top is smaller than a degree on the bottom, so it's going to go to zero. For this other one, okay, that would be like the opposite. So if we had a bigger root on top and a smaller, or I'm sorry, a bigger degree on the top and a smaller degree on the bottom, then it would go to infinity. So for example, the top is 5, the bottom has degree 2, so since the top is bigger than the bottom, it's going to go into infinity. Okay. The only thing that we have to make sure of is whether it's going to go to positive or negative infinity, and you can check that numerically or graphically. Now for the next one, it's going to equal an actual number, which will be a divided by b, if the degree of the top is equal to the degree of the bottom. Okay. Now, in this case, what we have to keep an eye out for is what are a and b? Well, a and b are going to be the leading coefficients of the top polynomial and the bottom polynomial. So an example of this would be if we were taking the limit as x approached infinity, and let's say we had 5x to the fourth plus 3x squared minus 1 divided by, <clears throat> let's see, for the bottom, let's do 8 x to the fourth minus x plus 112. Okay, so the degree of the top is 4 and the degree of the bottom is 4, which means that they have equal degrees. Now what this a and b are, 
they're the leading coefficients. That means that they are the constants that are in front of those highest terms. So this would be our a, and this would be our b. So what the limit would equal then, because none of these other terms matter, that limit would equal 5 divided by 8. Okay. So when you want to check your work, that's a really nice, easy, quick way to do that. All right, the next topic is going to be looking at vertical asymptotes. So before when we were looking at horizontal asymptotes, we were looking at x going to infinity and our y equaling some number. Vertical asymptotes feel flipped because what happens is that x is approaching a number, but then our y value goes crazy and approaches infinity. So for example, let's say that we want to find the vertical asymptotes of the function f of x which equals x cubed divided by x minus 3 times x plus 4 squared. So graphically, what we're looking at is we are looking at here when x equals negative 4 and here when x equals positive 3. So what we see happening is that as x approaches <clears throat> negative 4, Okay, our function starts to go crazy and our function has y values that go really, 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 really high. Same thing if we approach from the other side. As we get closer to negative 4, our y values are going to get really, really, really big. So they're going to go up like that. Now as we approach 3, well as we approach 3 from one side, we're going to go down to negative infinity. So as we approach from the left side. As we approach from the right side, we're going to go up to positive infinity. Okay. Now looking at that graphically, um, not so bad. Looking at numerically, also not so bad. Here's what we can see is that for x equals negative 4, as our x values get closer and closer to negative 4 from the right hand side, our y values are going to get super, super massive. Right? They're going to get really, really big. So this 9.137307 times 10 to the 6, that means that we actually have to move that decimal place 6 over to the right. So it's going to be a huge number in like the millions. Also, if we approach x from the left-hand side, what happens is that our y values are also going to get super, super, super big. Right? So both of these guys are getting big really fast, which means that they're tending towards infinity as our x values get closer to negative 4. Now, on the opposite side, when x approaches 3, we're going to have opposing behavior. So as x approaches 3 from the left-hand side, you can see that these values are getting bigger and bigger in the negative way. So that means it's approaching negative infinity. And as we approach from the right hand side, they're getting bigger and bigger in the positive way. So they're approaching positive infinity. So here's two different things that you can write down. <clears throat> For negative 4, you can write down that the limit is approaching infinity. Okay. For this one, it's approaching, well, it depends on which side you're coming to 3 at. So since these are opposing, we would say does not exist. What you might see in some textbooks is even though for x approaching negative 4 it equals infinity from both the left and the right, they might also say does not exist. So you might see both. Now a good rule of thumb is that when you're looking for vertical asymptotes, the vertical asymptotes are going to occur at the zeros of the denominator. Okay, so if we look back at this example, so we have our function f of x equals x to the third divided by x minus 3 times x plus 4 squared. Okay, To find where the vertical asymptotes are going to be, we would take this denominator and set it equal to 0 and solve. So this is going to equal 0 when x equals 3 and when x equals negative 4. So since you can't plug in 3 or negative 4 because then you'd be dividing by 0, what that means is that we're going to have this like invisible force field that our graph can't pass. That is why we're going to have vertical asymptotes at x equals 3 
and x equals negative 4. The other thing is that vertical asymptotes aren't the same thing as holes, so be careful. Vertical asymptotes have this specific behavior that as you get closer, you're going to end up dividing by a really small number, and dividing by a really small number means that your y values are going to get much, much bigger, Okay, either positively or, as we see on this side, negatively. All right. Last but not least, for this example, we want to find the horizontal and the vertical asymptotes of the graph below. So first, we're going to be looking at finding the horizontal asymptotes. Okay, and let's go ahead and let's do this in blue. No, let's do it in green. We haven't done green. So horizontal asymptotes. So we're going to be looking at the limit of this function. Let's go ahead and call it f of x. And let's look at when x goes to infinity. And let's also look as x goes to negative infinity. All right, so as my x value gets bigger, positively, so I'm going to be looking at it going this way, does it look like, if I follow my graph, does it look like my y value is kind of leveling out to some value? And it does. It looks like it's leveling out to this value right here. It looks like it's leveling out at y equals 2. So I'm going to have a horizontal asymptote at y equals 2. Now for the second one, does it look like as my x goes closer to negative infinity, does it look like my graph is leveling off at a different y value? And it does. It looks like my function or my y value is leveling off at y equals negative 1. So I'm going to have two different horizontal asymptotes. I'm going to have one at y equals 2 and another one at y equals negative 1. Now, when I'm exploring the vertical asymptotes, so I'll do those in blue, what I want to know is, hey, is there a spot where as x approaches some number, my function's y value goes to some sort of infinity, so positive or negative infinity. Okay. Now, I don't mean to spoil it for you guys, but we're actually going to have two of these. So if I look at my graph, do I see anywhere where it shoots down or shoots up? So what I notice is that if I follow my graph, okay, from left to right, all of a sudden right here, my graph starts to shoot down towards negative infinity. And that happens here, where it looks like x equals 0. So as x approaches 0, I'm actually going to have a vertical asymptote. And since they both agree and they're both shooting down, we can just say that it's going to negative infinity. OK, remember, that's the vertical asymptote right here. Now, if I continue to follow my graph, so let's keep looking at it, it looks like it's also going to shoot down over here and then shoot up on this side. So that tells me that I'm also going to experience a vertical asymptote here, and that vertical asymptote is going to occur as x gets closer to positive 2. And since I have one side as I approach from the left going down, towards negative infinity, and then as I approach from the right side going up towards positive infinity, okay, what I would say is instead of positive or negative infinity, remember, since they're opposing, I would say D, N, E. Also, when you're listing horizontal asymptotes and vertical asymptotes, you're not going to typically write them in limit notation. I just wanted to connect the ideas. How you're going to write them is you're going to write them as Y equals 2 and y equals negative 1, because that's where they're occurring, is at that line, y equals negative 1 and y equals 2. And likewise, when you're describing vertical asymptotes, you're also not going to be writing them in this limit notation. You're going to be writing them as they occur at x equals 0 and x equals 2, because they happen at those lines. So they happen at the line x equals 0 and x equals 2.